iCario is a health action company which strives to go beyond the typical patient engagement approach to motivate patients to actually do something. iCario's success has been driven by its ability to achieve results for health plans, the increasing need for outreach during the health emergency, and new competitive pressures on the company's customers from more consumer-oriented companies like retailers. CEO Steve Wigginton comes from an immigrant family with all the usual drive and familial expectations that go with that. After studying finance, he started his career in technology, and then he eventually moved into healthcare. He wishes now that he did that a bit sooner. After his success at Evelyn Health and then running an Aetna Sutter Health joint venture, he made his way to the company that became Icario. I'm David Williams, host of the Health Biz Podcast and president of Health Business Group, a strategy consulting firm that helps companies like Icario develop robust growth plans. Reach out to me, dwilliams at healthbusinessgroup.com if you'd like to discuss strategy for your company. While you're at it, please subscribe to the Health Biz Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Well, Steve Wigginton, CEO of iCario, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, we're going to talk about all sorts of interesting things that you're doing now at iCario, but I want to spend some time to understand how you got to this spot. And if you don't mind, uh, maybe going back to uh, childhood and asking you about any you know particular influences from childhood, uh, what sort of shaped you growing up, and you know how 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 has any of that uh, translated into your career? Well, that's a surprising place to start, but uh, I guess that is where I started, so it probably makes sense. Um, yeah, I think probably a unique uh, element of my upbringing was being a first-generation immigrant. I was born in England to English parents, and uh, they migrated here, immigrated here, I should say, to uh, to the U.S. when I was very young. And so, you know, all of the um, stereotypes about first-generation immigrants, hard work, a tolerance for risk, uh, a, a desire to you know, advance the family and pass on to the next generation. I got a lot of those traits, so they've served me pretty well. That's good. And then what did you study in school? Uh, I was a business major uh, at Indiana University. I had a finance undergrad degree, and then I got my MBA from Kelly there at IU as well. I saw a number of interesting things on your uh, LinkedIn in terms of your early career, Faros, Neopharma, Medley, and then on to uh, Evolent. Um, what, what was that progression uh, like? And was it sort of a logical progression at the time or were you all over the place? I was all over the place early. Uh, I, you know, part of the disadvantage of having first generation parents is you don't necessarily have the, the map that maybe some of your friends had in terms of their parents growing up in this economy, in this country, uh, going to these universities, et cetera. So I was, I was kind of all over the place. I figured out very early that I had more of an entrepreneurial streak or gene uh, than I did, uh, you know, working my way through the same job over a 20 year career. And that, you know, in the end, that served me well. Uh, I started out in content and software, the very early days of the internet. And then uh, with a company that I co-founded with two partners in, in the late 90s was acquired by a healthcare business called Neoforma. Uh, in 2000. And I've been in healthcare ever since and frankly wish I got into the industry a little sooner uh, just to be able to have a, a even more experience across the different facets of the industry. Now, Evolent is a company that I know uh, pretty well. I know you spent some time there. At what point in its evolution of Evolent did you, uh, did you arrive and what was the journey like? Yeah, well, um, very early. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember exactly what day it was, but but it was in the first year. Um, I had known Frank Williams for about five years through YPO. Actually, uh, we were both uh, running businesses in healthcare. He was obviously running at that time the advisory board, and uh, the team there had this idea to create a business in Evelyn that served uh, pr primarily providers who were trying to take on and manage risk in the in the new era of value-based care. Uh, and he and I had had many conversations about finding a way to work together. And when, when he took the plunge with Seth and Tom uh, to launch Evelyn, I was not far behind. Uh, and it was a phenomenal experience. You know, I, I, know, I know Frank Williams. I, I like Frank Williams, not just because my father's name is actually Alan Frank Williams. And also my dad worked at the Watergate office complex, which is where the advisory board was. So 
Uh, but Frank was a was a super good guy as a Seth Blackley um, as well, and so that was a good that was a good training ground. So I have to ask now: the next thing you did is you you went to a, a joint venture between uh, Sutter and and Etna, and I have to say maybe this will be the exception that proves the rule. But my experience with joint ventures is they're they're awfully stressful and are not usually worth the uh, juice is not usually worth the squeeze. But tell me otherwise on on the one you were involved with. Well, I wouldn't disagree that there's a, there's a level of stress involved. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a different kind of stress than you know certainly the job I have now at Acario, where you're you're running a standalone business and you're thinking about capital and cash and acquisitions and and you've got a, a broader set of concerns, if you will. But a joint venture, you're balancing very often stakeholders that are only aligned around the joint venture. And, and in most other aspects of their respective businesses, um, they're either at opposite ends of the supply chain or potentially even competing. Uh, and in the case of Sutter, a large health system in Northern California and Aetna, obviously a, a leading insurer, you know, we would, before and after our board meetings, my board members were very often in disagreement about their core business conflicts. Uh, and so it was only in our boardroom, frankly, that, that, that they were able to, to collaborate in the ways that we were trying to collaborate. I'd say in terms of ju juice being worth the squeeze, David, it, it's, you know, I think it depends what your objectives are. If they are purely financial, uh, if you're trying to capture share, if there's, if there's some aspects of the, the purpose of the JV um, that are, let's say, challenged by the respective uh, core businesses of the two participants or more, um, yeah, you'll often see those struggle. I think in the case of the joint ventures that Aetna has done around the country uh, with Inova in the, in the D.C. area, um, in Arizona with Banner, in Northern California with Sutter Health, it's actually allowed them to innovate and think differently from inside what is otherwise a quite dominant insurer. And I think it's given, in the case of Sutter Health, it gave them a lens on how particularly employers and ASO employers, self-funded employers, looked at the world that, that you know, as the provider system, I don't think they fully understood. So th there's definitely benefits, but uh, it's a challenge to execute the business uh, when you're balancing the co competing needs of the two owners. And that's where, you know, when you're the CEO of one of those, it is stressful and you have to measure success uh, a little bit differently. So now Icario, so two questions about that. One, why did you join it? And second, what is it? Yeah, well, uh, I'll start with the first. So, you know, I mentioned I've been in healthcare now a little over 20 years. Uh, most of that time, including when we were at Evelyn, uh, helping providers uh, take and manage risk in, in value-based scenarios. I was a part of behavioral health business, a business that did high-risk chronic care management. Uh, we were, I worked with a physician network uh, to, to provide more comprehensive services. Across all of those businesses, we had a common challenge, and that was we would create some interventional goodness, which I'm sure is not an official term in the Webster Dictionary, but uh, we would have a care coaching program that was proven to help people with depression better manage depression and, as a result, improve their heart disease. Or we would have a behavioral health program that was shown if you took advantage of that behavioral health program, you would get anxiety and stress under control. But getting human beings to actually take advantage of that goodness was always the challenging part of every one of those experiences. Um, the, the uptake, the engagement, people's uh, willingness to take advantage of what we were trying to help them with was always a real challenge. And so after running the joint venture for a couple of years, I really felt like I wanted to get back to leading a business, uh, a standalone business. And I looked at a number of different companies uh, to see if I could find one that that would inspire me in you know what is arguably the latter part of my career, and I came across a company called Novu Health, and Novu, uh, led by a founder Tom Wicca, ten years of really uh, great success, using loyalty and consumer engagement strategies that consumer brands use all the time uh, in healthcare on behalf of health plans. And I worked with the board there and agreed to come on as the CEO. And, and we really saw that the board and the investors and I saw that, that company as a platform to bring together a few other businesses that were solving similar and adjacent problems. 
And over the last 18 months, we, we brought three companies together, a company called Chip Rewards based in Birmingham, uh, co another company based in uh, Minneapolis called Revel Health and Novu, which is also based in Minneapolis. And we rebranded those businesses a year ago, actually, January of 21, as Acario. And the idea is really on behalf of payers primarily and increasingly, particularly in the last four or five months, we're seeing interest from providers, helping them behave more like consumer brands in the way that they communicate and interact with the what they call members or patients or whatever label they put on us as human beings. And so there's a, a number of different capabilities we have either to motivate action on behalf of their uh, the individuals they're serving or get information from them, uh, which the, the risk-bearing entity, if you will, can then use to provide better health services, uh, illustrating awareness of benefits. So there's a number of different use cases, but the, the special sauce is really the technology and the data science that we use, uh, and then the behavioral health and behavioral sciences that we apply to the program design to help healthcare companies behave more like consumer brands. Got it. So, you know, each person is obviously uh, different as an individual. And at the same time, you know, there's different populations that call them within, uh, you know, within a health plan or a provider organization or, or anywhere. And I think primarily about kind of a commercial population, Medicare, Medicare Advantage for, for health plans, and then, and then Medicaid. Do you think about kind of the engagement and the encouraging action differently across those populations or some other sort of segmentation? For sure, um, and, and, and I'd say, yes, some other segmentation to use your term. I think a, a very special part of our differentiation is uh, really pushing the envelope on segmentation uh, and personalization. Our goal is to be at, at what we call N equal one. Uh, we're not there yet, but ideally you would like to be able to communicate to each human being in a, in a very unique and tailored way and with technology and artificial intelligence machine learning, that's becoming increasingly possible. Uh, but to your larger question, yes, you see categorical differences between the Medicare Advantage population, you know, 65 and older, uh, uh, obviously in a higher health utilization mode than, than the, hopefully, than, than those of us who are in, in our 30s, 40s. Um, and, and also the things that we see for our customers, Medicare, Medicaid, dual SNP, the exchange population, any of these programs that have government funding uh, behind them, there are also a number of quality measures that are designed to hold the risk-bearing entities accountable for not just um, cost, but also quality, making sure that uh, the intent of prevention, uh, wellness, having annual wellness visits, all of those activities that are proven to keep us healthier longer at a lower cost are actually happening. Those measures are, are very helpful for us and for our clients because uh, they give us a measurable return on an, our investment. So if I make an investment to communicate to a group of Medicare Advantage members about the importance of an annual wellness visit and the measurement that the CMS uses to evaluate my performance, STARS, not to get overly technical, but, but the yeah. STARS measure improves, then the reimbursement level goes up for the health plan. They can invest more in the benefits for the members. The members are getting preventative screening. So there's a virtuous cycle there, but the, the measures are very helpful. If you go to the corporate population, the commercial population, that's more challenging. And you see a proliferation of wellness, um, you know, step programs and gym memberships and a bunch of different um, yeah. uh, uh, interventional type consumer facing uh, offerings. The, but those, the, the motivations for those are more complex. It could be about retaining employees. Uh, it, it, you know, it could be, there could be other measures that are a, a little less discreet. And so our business has grown much more rapidly in the government program space because of the existence of these quality measurement requirements and the challenge of, of executing against those for payers. So I see you describe yourself as a health action company and you, you, you use that word action before. And I wonder how that's different from a typical engagement player. I guess when I, my initial reaction to seeing health action is that it's sort of like, you know, it's hard to get people to do something. And so let's, let's actually amp it up and talk about like taking it to the next level. But what's, you know, what's beyond that? What's behind that philosophy? How do you differ from engagement? 
Yeah, well, engagement in, in, at some level, health action is laddered up from engagement. Uh, you know, reaching out to someone and, and communicating to them or with them uh, and not generating a result um, is a luxury. It's not an investment. And so we, we are very focused at Acario on delivering outcomes and our clients are very focused on it. And in our, even in our core values, as we describe inside our, our I was gonna say our four walls, like we've got a lot of walls now yeah. uh, as, as, a, as a, a virtual business. Uh, but w within, within Acario, one of the things that is front and center in our, uh, our vision statement and, and the work we're trying to do is to create value. And one thing that I believe strongly after 20 plus years in healthcare is if the service you're providing or the technology you're developing or the drug you're launching or the intervention that you are delivering doesn't either improve health or lower costs or ideally both, it's not sustainable. You may get a spike, you may have some adoption, you may be able to uh, you know, create a little bit of momentum around your business, but it, it's, it's too critical to be able to prove value over time. Um, and so bring that down a level. For us, Health Action says, if you need people to go take an annual wellness visit, we are not in the business of just mailing stuff. We're in the business of getting people to schedule and hold an appointment with a physician. And we wanna be measured that way because that drives us to be accountable. And it also, of course, brings a lot of stickiness with our client relationships, a lot of recurrence. You mentioned um, you know, how you put together multiple companies uh, here to form Icario. And I think it makes sense because you're describing something that's typically available on the consumer side, but less so in healthcare. So you had to kind of to pull it together. Are you now to the point where, okay, now that's done and you, you kind of grow organically from there, or do you see the need to be pulling in you know, certain other capabilities, certain other companies in order to fulfill the overall vision? Yeah, great question. I'd say yes to both. Um, you know, last year, in the middle of the year, we recapitalized Acario uh, with CVC Capital Partners, uh, one of the largest private equity uh, funds in the world, actually. Um, and, and part of the reason we did that was to have the capacity uh, to add capabilities inorganically through acquisition uh, but also, we, we have experienced tremendous growth organically. Last year was a fantastic year. We're off to a great start uh, here in 2022. Um, I think the way we think about it is more from a customer perspective and less from what, you know, what, what, what do we have on our shelves. And if you look at the health insurance market, particularly in the provider market, arguably as well, there's a lot of consolidation, particularly in government programs. So, you know, the top three MA players have more than 50% of the market. In Medi managed Medicaid, you know, similar, the Centines and the Molinas of the world continue to grow and leverage scale to deliver value, to be clear. So, um, so when you think about a market, our market is con relatively consolidated. Our customers are saying to us, I really appreciate that you're solving problem A, B, D, and F. Could you tackle C and E as well? Because then we've got one data feed. We've got one set of reports. You, Acario, did these two programs with our membership. Our internal team did this other thing. And we're trying to figure out like which worked better, which generated more yield, which was more efficient. And so for a lot of reasons, we're, we'll continue to expand our offerings, but we're doing it in a way that uh, our customers are really asking us to, as yeah. opposed to just stacking up unrelated businesses that you know, might be for sale uh, in, in some kind of M&A uh, transaction. So it sounds like what, you know, what happened is you, you put together this sort of course set of capabilities to be able to offer something differentiated and in a sufficient scale. And then uh, as the uh, customers get used to working with you, first of all, they're, they're probably not going to hand over everything to start with. So they Correct. start with a footprint that you have. It's successful. But then I've seen a lot of these things where there's like an ROI calculation and you're trying to say, well, what do I, you know, I attribute this to that. And as you say, there's A through E and you're doing A, D and E. Right. You know, what about what about the other pieces of that? So then it gives you sort of a natural opportunity perhaps to come in um, and, and take more of that as you built the customer trust. They want to measure the value and you have the capital resources to do it. So, hey, it sounds uh, it sounds easy and straightforward. I don't know why I didn't think about it. <laughs> now, what's happening? Anything but yeah. that, as our team yeah. members would tell you, it's uh, and, in, and in, you know, this is a different a different world. In the old days, you'd fly everybody in for three days and, right. and dip, them, dip them in the in the sauce, and everybody would kind of walk out with a new sweatshirt feeling great. And yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely more challenging, uh, uh, I think, than 
my prior experiences in, in bringing together teams and cultures. But, uh, but our team has done an amazing job. I'm, I'm That's super good. excited about the work. Well, not, not to go back to the JV side, but you had good, I think you had good training for that. Let's talk a little bit about how the market has changed over the past couple of years. Clearly been in an unusual uh, situation. You even just mentioned sort of just internally going from four walls to however many walls or, or no walls. What's happening in terms of, you know, looking at those patients, those members that you need to engage with? What are the sort of needs that are emerging there that have to be addressed? I know early on, one of the things you mentioned was behavioral health. And I know that, you know, that's one of the new, new yeah. stress areas. But I mean, how do you assess beyond just running the company? What are the needs out there that, you know, that have to be dealt with? Yeah, well... Uh, boy, that's a big question. Uh, you're right. Behavioral health is a big one. Uh, virtual and telehealth and, and how that actually gets integrated into the fabric of what we would have thought of as traditional care delivery. Um, you know, the, the model of that certainly our parents grew up with of having a doctor uh, who was at the practice in their town, you know, has has been. I thought really our parents grew up with the NHS. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's still there. Um, right. But, but you know, that, so that, that consistent reference point and how do I access care? Should I go to HIMSS, you know, or should I, you know, should I go online or do, do I call on the virtual, you know, the, the first health or whichever virtual care provider you have? And, and is that a transaction or is that a relationship? Like that's all scrambled. Um, and, you know, for Acario, we, we have seen growth in our business in leading consumers to these newly available outlets. So behavioral health companies that have launched virtual coaching and, and virtual therapy, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, talking about my career, you know, the problems are not new. These, these things are available and people don't take advantage of them. So how do you get them? How do you encourage trial? That, that's, we're in the trial business. So we get people to say, hey, why don't you log in? If you log in, look what happens. And then once you do that, hey, we'll give you a gift card whatever the, the mechanisms are to drive trial. I think the other thing we've seen, uh, if I go back to June of 2020, May of 2020, I started as a CEO at Novu on, in May of 2020. In the six or eight weeks prior, um, as we're all well aware, was the onset of the public health emergency, COVID, the pandemic, whatever labels you wanna put on that. And all the insurance companies that were uh, clients of Novu for the first four or five weeks, completely ceased communicating with their members about anything except COVID. It was fascinating. And as you might imagine, being the CEO of a business that was essentially the factory was shut for eight weeks. <laughs> it, yeah. was a, it was a heck of a first couple of months. Um, but to their credit, what they figured out is life goes on and seniors that aren't getting an annual wellness visit that need one or that need medication adherence or reconciliations you know, yes, COVID is a problem, but we've got to get our, in the case of an insurer, our members, the people they serve, we have to make sure that they're accessing the critical care that they need, that they're taking the preventative measures to catch breast cancer early, to catch colon cancer early. Like these things are proven. And, and so the, the challenge now for a lot of payers is how do they weave that into everything else they're trying to do, retain members, satisfy members. CMS continues to change the way they measure the performance of their contracted health plans in the MA space. So there's, there's a lot of change. And I think we're both of those things, the, the new modalities and then the change that's impacted th this industry overall, um, they've driven growth for us. And they've also, I think, uh, highlighted how important our technology platform is to be able to slice and dice and sequence and prioritize and understand that there's nine things you'd like to say to me, but the number one most important thing is X and I'm gonna make sure that that's the one that gets through. So we'll see. Uh, I think a, a lot of dust yet to settle, uh, particularly on the, you know, how we access care front. Um, a lot of disconnected, fragmented, valuable solutions, but you know, disease specific, or it's all about behavioral health. Well. That's one part of me, but that's not all my health. So we'll have to see how that sorts out. You know, the payers have, have clearly had challenges in, uh, in getting members to engage and they hire, you know, internal people or, or companies like Icario to help them. 
the big provider organizations, a lot of them that are sort of hospital dominated, have had their challenges uh, during the health emergency, but also before that. And one of the things I've seen happen, we've all seen happen over the last while, is that you know some of the big retailers like you know Walgreens or Walmart getting more involved in care delivery. And they are inherently more oriented toward the consumer side, you know, where you started talking about where they, where they have this sort of things. And they're just close to the customer and people are coming in there, there frequently. How do changes there in that, in that sector impact uh, what you do at Icario? You know, interestingly, I think probably it's a tailwind for our, from a business standpoint, it's a tailwind because if I'm running a large health system and Walmart decides to open 12 clinics in my catchment area and they siphon off a bunch of primary care and, and basic care uh, and I'm left with hospitals that are, you know, expensive and I have to operate because they're critical access hospitals, it just puts a lot of pressure on those providers. You, you've, you've seen a lot of them opening walk-in clinics, uh, clinics and providing virtual care. So trying to compete uh, with, from an access and a convenience standpoint. You know, they do have the advantage of trusted brands. And so when they come to Acario, very often they're looking for help to uh, amplify the voice of those trusted brands. And, and a lot of times what they struggle with, David, is you know, they don't call you a person, they call you a patient, even when you're not right. sick. I mean, it's just cultural. And so yeah. they can hire a marketer uh, and, and, you know, try to that marketer will try to bend the curve inside the health system. But it's a challenge. Um, I, we haven't seen much yet. I think one of my observations as an older person in healthcare is, you know, some of these retail led initiatives. We all remember the famous Berkshire Hathaway, Amazon that, oh, you know, it's going to yeah. change everything. Um, very often what these entities do is they end up hiring traditional healthcare people who, who end up executing a largely healthcare centric model. And then we've also got all the, you know, regulation and, and uh, you know, I, I don't know, the compliance requirements of healthcare, which are non-negotiable. So I don't know that pure retail has as big of an advantage moving into care delivery as perhaps we might think on first blush. And of course, as soon as I say that, you know, we'll be proven wrong, but um, it feels a little bit like as Walmart and these other, you know, uh, behemoths enter into care delivery, they're running up against some challenges that they just don't face in other parts of their business and, and in some cases lose patients. Yeah. So it does sound like that, you know, who know an what an announcement does is it gets your customers thinking, okay, we better do something. Icaro's here, you know, here and now. We'll worry right. later about, you know, where that, exactly that goes. It's funny you talk about um, Haven, you know, between uh, Berkshire Hathaway and, and J.P. Morgan and Amazon. When, uh, when they shut that down and they hired uh, Dan Mendelson, who was at Evalier, to, to run Morgan Health, I said, is this New Haven, you know, as in Connecticut? But <laughs> He did. He did. I don't know if he liked that comment or not, but <clears throat> anyway, it's it is kind of funny. very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what. That's that. what. That's just sort of what struck me. And, and yeah. when you talked about like being referred to as a patient, it reminded me also of sort of the disadvantage of like what you know, like a regulated utility has, where they'll think about you know rate payers, and it's not right. inherently a customer. And it's just how they're structured. You know, they have this number of rate payers, and that's how their that's how their revenue is. You know, calculated and right. uh, and agreed upon. So you have it. Yeah, they've got um, they've got loads of powerpoints inside those regulated industries that say yeah. we should think of them as customers and da 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 da. But it's so deeply baked into their businesses and their culture. It, it's tough, and healthcare is the same. Wait, just back on providers, just quickly. Yeah, more so than in, in my experience, when I think about some of the very innovative, progressive providers, Banner Health in Arizona comes to mind. What I see motivating their innovation is more value-based care than retail incursion. Yeah. Um, you know, they obviously have to pay attention to, to retail. I, that's my term, retail incursion is probably not even accurate, whatever the right way to say that is. Um, but value-based care is tricky because um, if you're a provider system, what you're used to is people walk through your door, you do great work, uh, you do it efficiently at a high standard, you negotiate with payers for that. Maybe you negotiate a value-based deal around that. The challenge is half the people that you are attributed, that you're responsible for, you're not gonna see in a given year. And so this, this, this way of communicating and connecting with consumers who are not yet your patient, at least not this month, staying connected to them, uh, making sure you've got a dialogue going and you're engaged with them, 
um, is a new frontier for us. It's, it's, and it's really being driven more by value-based care than it is you know, feeling the need to consume, compete with consumer brands. It's a tricky one because if you just take the value-based care population, you know, if someone isn't sick, you basically want to be engaging with them and not seeing them. So that's good. Right. But then right. you've also got another set of people that are on a fee-for-service basis. And so you're telling the people that are working with you, I mean, you've got to go with almost a completely different, almost a completely opposite set of, uh, of, of motivations uh, for one population versus another. And you can't expect yeah. people to treat all the patients differently. Yeah. I mean, you know, you made some comments earlier about uh, the, the joint venture between Aetna and Sutter. You know, that was one of the places where, where we did see benefit, right? Because as a 50% owner of the insurance business, as an enterprise, Sutter's mission was supported by members of that insurance panel that didn't actually come through the door of Sutter. And so if I remember when we were when I was first talking with Seth and Frank about about Evelyn and I think and UPMC Health Plan was was a strategic uh, co-founder of that business. I think our vision back then was every major health system with a big catchment area would launch a health plan and be right. able to, you know, essentially retain the insurance profits to offset the loss in procedural profits or, or, or care delivery profits. And um, in fact, that hasn't happened. There's, there right. were other complexities around that, but, but yeah, it's a, it's a riddle. Um, they're, they're getting it though. And, and I think the increasing um, experience that providers are gaining now around value-based deals and understanding, like I have to, I have to have a consumer relationship with people and I don't necessarily want them to come through the door unless they need to. And, and that's, right. that's new. That's a new muscle. Yeah. So you know, you're talking about how um, back in the early, you know, in 2020, the plans were just communicating uh, with the members on kind of one topic. There was also a lot going on in the sort of the general, you know, political environment uh, then and, and, and still now. So I actually want to ask you about the impact of misinformation, because, you know, it's not just the health plan or Icario that is uh, directing communication. It's all the things around us in um, every form of media and uh, word of mouth and so on. And does misinformation actually figure into, you know, how you think about engagement? You know, people are exposed to certain things, uh, certain types of information that maybe are, you know, counter to what the plan might expect. and not going to be helpful for their health if they were to follow them. Just just wondering if that comes in at all. It wouldn't have been a topic maybe five years ago, but today I think it, it, it has to be. Yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, and I guess the short answer is yes. So we have part, part of our value proposition for our clients is we have a, a dedicated, uh, quite experienced team of researchers um, and content creation experts and as we analyze the data on a given population and we, we get information from our clients that says here's 12,000 seniors that have not had an annual wellness visit, for example, or haven't had a breast cancer screening, we then push a bunch of consumer data that we've acquired against that list to enhance our understanding. And then we use research to try to identify where are the gaps going to be from a communication standpoint? And misinformation is an emerging piece of that. I wouldn't say it's front and center, but it is an emerging piece of that. We, we've had several clients ask us to support uh, their vaccination efforts. Uh, for yeah. example, we work with the federal employee plan uh, that many of our Blues clients uh, work with to support education and confirmation of vaccination. And so, you know, that's probably exhibit A for let's say mixed information, maybe, maybe not miss. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mixed. Good. So last question, Steve is about, um, have you had a chance to read any books and anything that you would uh, recommend for our listeners and, uh, and viewers? And it's okay if they, you know, if you haven't had time, but if you do have something, uh, let us know. Yeah, no, well, we, we just returned from our, uh, traditional annual, uh, family vacation. I have my wife, Nancy, who's a, a physician herself, actually. So there's a, I have another lens on our business, which yeah. uh, I, I, I jokingly say I got through pillow talk. But uh, well, we had our, our, our family vacation. I did manage to get through uh, Boys in the Boat again, which yeah. I'm sure many of your listeners have read. Um, I rode crew in in, uh, in college and it, it resonated. Just 
so much of that book resonated with me. I got a chance to, to rip through that one again. And then um, what did I read? Oh, I had, a, I had a fun one that my son gave me called Lincoln Highway. Uh, which nice. is uh, which is a really interesting um, uh, fiction book that was 600 pages that I ripped through in maybe two afternoons. <laughs> so those, those are, are my two. I don't know that they're all ha high and fancy, but uh, that's okay. You know. This isn't Facebook or Meta here. You don't have to frame your life in a certain way. It sounds <laughs> it sounds genuine and uh, and useful. No, it's just it's just the one I've got, David. It's just the one I've got. Sounds good. Well, Steve Wigginton, CEO of Icario, thanks so much for sharing your wisdom and your history here on the Health Biz Podcast. You bet. Thanks for having me.